Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to see you all on this snowy morning. If you're visiting with us, you are our honored guest, and we are grateful that you're here. We hope that you come to know the love of God a little better by spending time with us this morning. I just want to take a moment and reaffirm what Andy said, what Mark said about what we have going on over here. And this is this is just so incredible. I'm extremely excited about what is happening here. This is, this is the fulfillment of so, something that we've been preaching about over and over and over again here in 2021. You know, the idea that, you know, being the church, being the new creation of God in the world means that we are going to turn around and bless the world that is around us, you know. Now, by, by creating these blessing bags that, we're gonna, that you're going to grab and hand out today, uh, sharing these Thanksgiving meals, providing these coats to whether they're older people or kids or whatever, you know, we are doing something special. We are being that light on the hill that we want to be, right? You know, I, I could not be more excited for what we're doing, not just this one-time event either. You know, as, as you've heard, we've transformed our Wednesday night. This time of gathering that we spend in the middle of the week is now going to be devoted to doing actual times of service, getting, putting our faith into action, if you will, right? And, you know, there's still scripture, there's still prayer, there's still learning, but now there's more time for community, more time for fellowship, and we're actually performing real life faith in action and putting everything, putting service uh, all around. So hoping that these events that we do, as we do them, will lead to our ability to share the gospel with other people, that, that people in re- receiving this gift or hearing the word of God from them will turn around and, and know that there is a king, right? That will know that the, the order of this world, the reign of this world, which is based around selfishness and taking and dog eat dog is not the way of the Lord who really reigns over this realm, okay? And that's what we're doing. I'm just very excited for that. You know, that's what, that's what this is all about, folks, is, you know, we are a church who has a God-given burden for the lost and suffering in the world, right? And now we are doing our very best and being very active about helping those people and being Jesus to the people who would receive those gifts. And I, like I said, I'm really excited about that. I'll quit preaching about that because we're going to preach about something else. Um, so in fact, so this morning is our last, um, our last sermon in the Fruit of the Spirit series that we've been doing for six or seven weeks now. And I hope that you enjoyed this series, that it's giving you new insights into these virtues of uh, faithful living. And as I've said before, I hope that each of us has been able to find a fruit or two in our life that maybe isn't, isn't being produced at the level we would like for it to be at. And so we're going to stop and we're going to work with the Holy Spirit to produce this fruit more and more in our lives so we can be living to the highest potential that God has called us to. Now, so the last fruit for us to cover, the very last of Paul's list there is self-control. And I had some great jokes about being self-controlled Ohio State fans when Purdue was going to win yesterday, but that did not happen. Uh, and I had to learn my own self-control on Saturday night. But, you know, it's a, it's a pretty important one, right? This is, in the big scheme of things, this is really important because it often can lead to the success or the failure of many other fruit of the Spirit, right? Just think about it with me. If, if you lack self-control, you're not going to, if you lack self-control with your temper, you're not going to have very much peace, will you? Amen. You know, if, you're, if you don't have self-control uh, to be patient for something that you want, you're not, you're not going to have that patience. You know, it takes self-control to love, hard to love people. It takes self-control to stay faithful through hard times. So really, this is, this is a very beneficial fruit for us, I think, to wrap up these ideas with so that we can be fully effective moving forward. But just consider with, a moment, consider with me for a moment, if you will, do we actually value self-control? I'm not asking if we're good at self-control because we're not, okay? Our world is just buried in addiction and immediate gratification. You know, but do we consider self-control to be a virtue anymore? Just objectively. Do we actually think it's important or good to even have? I just, I just think about what we talk about and, and what we really value in this world. I feel like I'm constantly hearing conversations of people saying things like, hey, do whatever you want, regardless of what anyone else thinks, right? Or if you want it, you take it. And there are, there are contexts 
where that can be appropriate and that can be helpful. You know, if, if somebody is in an unhealthy situation, that wouldn't be the moment to exercise persistence or self-control or patience, right? They would need to remove themselves from that situation and find uh, safety. But there are many other times where we use these kind of phrases, we use these kind of terms just to give ourselves an excuse to get whatever we want, don't we? Yeah, we absolutely do. You know, self-control is maybe seen these days, uh, culturally at least, as being prudish, as being maybe ignorant, or maybe just, uh, more simply put, a buzzkill. <laughs> yeah? I'm, I'm not sure self-control is as widely appreciated as it used to be, or more importantly, as it, as it should be. You know, to give a more, objection, a more objective picture of self-control, Dr. Walter Michelle was an Ivy League professor who did a study on self-control with five-year-olds. He would put them in a room alone for 15 minutes with a marshmallow, okay? And the instructor would, would, they would they'd sit there and tell them, hey, don't eat this marshmallow. We're going to leave the room, leave you all, around, all alone here in this room for 15 minutes. Don't eat the marshmallow. And when we come back, if you have not eaten the marshmallow, we'll give you two marshmallows, right? Maybe you've heard of this before. It was, it was pretty well known. Uh, and as you can imagine, some of the kids waited and some of the kids did, did not, Okay. But the interesting thing to me here is the fact that this study was done a, a few decades ago. It's actually, this wasn't any time recently. Uh, and they continued to follow these five-year-olds as they grew up. And they tracked their lives and they, they kept base with them. And they, they were figuring out how they were growing up and who they were becoming. And what they found out was that the kids who did not eat the marshmallows have throughout their lives shown to be healthier, use less drugs, get more advanced degrees, and cope better with stress. Isn't that interesting? That those things correlated with a five-year-old being able to wait or not wait on a table with a marshmallow. You know, self-control, is it's not just about looking pious, okay? Self-control has these larger ripple effects of positive results throughout our lives. You know, this God-given fruit will help us live out the full and abundant life that God desires for each one of us to have, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationships, or spiritually. You know, self and, you know sometimes we, we treat self-control like the opposite, though, don't we? It's not something that is good for us. It's something that hinders us. That it's a, it, Self-control is just a hindrance to our freedom that we should cast off, you know, and I hope that you, what you see here, I hope that as people who have maybe studied the Bible for your entire life or grown up in places that have encouraged self-control, I hope that what you see, what it's actually doing is raising you up to experience better freedoms, okay? It's not holding you back from freedoms, telling you you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. To an extent, maybe it is, but that's not, it's not just this arbitrary restriction, okay? It is empowering us to experience better freedoms. It's, it's not so much a freedom from, but it is a freedom to. And that is a much more powerful and a much more joyous kind of thing. But even if we do understand that self-control is, is good for us in many different ways, that doesn't make it any easier to actually accomplish self-control, does it? We understand that it's good, or hopefully you do, but that doesn't make it any easier to do. It, you know, it sounds easy, right? Self-control. Control yourself. Nobody's running your show like a puppet master, right? All you have to do is control yourself. In fact, there's this um, great little comedy sketch that I love, and I don't, it, it has Bob Newhart in it. I don't know how old it is or where it's from, but he's playing a psychologist, and a lady comes in and says, hey, I'm, I'm really afraid of being buried alive in a wooden box. And his advice was, well, we'll stop that. That sounds horrible. Why would, you, why would you be afraid of that? Why would you think about that? Just don't, don't do that anymore, right? It sounds so much easier than it actually is. And in fact, I like the way Paul says it uh, with his tongue twister fashion in Romans chapter 7. He says, For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I, I have the desire to do what is good, but I do not carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. You know, even Paul, this, this great apostle and man of God who followed Jesus closely and was in tune with the Spirit, he admitted that he oftentimes struggled to maintain his own self-control. And if Paul had such a hard time with this, you know, what are, what are we going to do? You and me, who aren't Paul, who aren't this great apostle, what are, what are we going to do? Have you ever had that moment where, you know, you've, you've done this thing and you just decide to swear off this vice in your life. You know, I promise myself, I promise God, I am never going to do this again. And before you can bat your eye, what are you doing? You're doing it again, right? 
And it's such a frustrating feeling. It feels helpless sometimes that you can't overcome, that you can't gain this self-control. To know that you want to grow and you want to do the right thing, but you're constantly falling short, it's such a, a hard and frustrating feeling. So we have to ask, you know, how do we develop a stronger sense of self-control? How, how do we gain this virtue? Well, I, I think there's two main steps to that. Understanding that, one, there is something within us that needs to be controlled, okay? That there is something inside of us that is fighting to do what is wrong. And two, that there's a power out there that helps us control it. So, first, we need to understand that we do have a sinful nature, right? We do have a sinful nature. Because of the brokenness of this world, we simply have these inclinations to do what is wrong. For some people, it's lust. For other people, it's greed. For others, it's something as inconsequential or seemingly inconsequential as gossiping or lying. You know, we all have this sinful nature that needs to be controlled. And while we're never probably going to ever rid ourselves of these evils completely, we want to make sure that this thing within us, this thing that the Bible calls the flesh, right? You've heard Stan and I talk about this. The Greek is the sarks, right? This flesh, this evil desire within us is contained. We want to make sure that it specifically does not have mastery over us, okay? We might fall into temptation here and there, but we don't want this sinful nature to have mastery over us. I have this good friend... um, we were talking last year, and we were talking about how much he loves Coke. Uh, y'all call it pop, right? Just, you know, Coke is a generic term where I was raised. Okay, but you know, how much he loved Coke, and he would have Coke all the time, good days, bad days, and he, he said, I probably have a, a different form of soda, you know, at dinner every single night, okay? And he was telling me about this, and we were talking about spirituality and spiritual disciplines, and he told me how he decided to cut out Coke for a month. For a full month, he wasn't going to have a, a single carbonated beverage. And that, that kind of surprised me a, a little bit. You know, Coke seems like a pretty harmless thing. And we did talk about when we were doing the spiritual disciplines early in the year that taking care of our bodies is a spiritual discipline. But he seemed pretty healthy to me, so I just kind of thought this was a, an odd thing to choose in a spiritual manner. But what he told me was that he simply wanted to make sure, and he used this term, that it did not have mastery over him. Something as, as, as inconsequential, something as, as simple and insignificant as Coca-Cola, he wanted to make sure that it did not have mastery over him. And I've taken that with me. I found that to be really profound. He also, he told me that once a year, he takes two weeks and doesn't eat red meat. Because like many of us, he's just a carnivore, right? We like, we like the, the red meat. And he, for two weeks, every year, he doesn't eat it to make sure that, hey, that, this does not have mastery over me. I think that's important that we should look in our lives and ask, you know, what is it that's challenging the reign of Jesus in my life? What is it that's challenging the reign of Jesus in my life? And if there's anything, any sin or anything just in general that is showing mastery over us, and that's something we need to put into check, right? That's something we need to get under control to practice that self-control and put under our own, our own feet. But that still kind of leaves us with the question, right? How do we do that? How do we gain the self-control in our life? And that's the second step here, to recognize the source of power to find control. There is a source of power to find control. You know, uh, in Dr. Michelle's study, the kids who succeeded in not eating that marshmallow, they found ways to distract themselves or to distance themselves from the marshmallow. You know, they would turn their back on it. They would push it away. One of, the, one of them, I think, pretended it was wood because, they're, you know, they're five, right? But just finding little ways to keep themselves away from that temptation. They did things that, that changed its impact on them. Well, I think those kind of psychological tools are helpful, and they they should be utilized by us today. I think we as Christians also have something so much stronger that we can use to overcome temptations. Isn't that right? The answer to our struggles, especially within self-control, it's not so much inward as it is upward. What is this whole lesson about, right? This is a lesson, this is a series on the fruit of the Spirit. Thank you. You know, self-control is produced by the Spirit living within us, by God Himself. The more we know that Spirit, the more that we abide in God's Word, the more that we spend time in prayer, and all these other disciplines that we talked about at the beginning of the year, they're going to help our capacity to live out God's will for our life. The more that we do that, the more the Spirit is going to produce these fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because here's the frustrating truth, 
okay? We can't do it. Have you ever wondered why you had such a hard time overcoming that one temptation, that one struggle in your life? My guess is because you're trying to do it on your own, okay? Because your own human will is unable to face Satan's temptations over and over again. And you, as a, as a fallen human being living in this earth, are not going to be able to beat Satan by yourself. Human willpower is, is simply not strong enough in this broken, fallen world. But it is through the power of God working through us that we can be transformed into something better. And that's the way we do it, folks. That's the way we do it. The power of God working in and through us along the way. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For Christ's love compels us. And I think that's a really short, simple way to put it right there. It's exactly right. I can't do it on my own. But with the love of Christ motivating me and working through me, I have a new future ahead of me. Okay? Just through Christ's love alone. So before our closing comments this morning, I do want to give us our last week of... Um, of homework. We've done this along the way. Hopefully you've done this along the way, right? These little practices to help us produce these fruit as we go. So with self-control, I do have two options this week. Either memorize a few verse, uh, verses to help you when you're being tempted that you can use to kind of combat that. Does that strike a, a bell for you at all? This is what Jesus did, right? Being tempted in the wilderness. He had scriptures to use to combat Satan's temptations. But the other idea here is just to do a week-long fast is something you fear may have mastery over you. Whether that's Netflix or social media or cable news, whatever it might be that might have mastery of you, just, just take a break. Remind yourself that you are in control and that you do not need that thing. And hopefully these will all help us as we, as we strive to be a little bit more self-controlled in our lives, as we, as we try and attempt to be more and more like our Savior. But as we close, I do want to just take a moment or two to point out some of, the, I think, the big picture things that have been here along the way. That throughout our time studying the fruit of the Spirit, there's been these few things that just keep popping up over and over again. And that's the idea that, you know, we may not always feel these things, but we should always have them as a foundation. For example, we talk that we might be sad sometimes. We might be stressed sometimes. But hopefully through it all, we have a foundation of joy. We have a foundation of peace. That even though the winds and the, and the chaos might be going on around us, we have that inner joy and peace on the inside. The second is that the closer we grow to God, the more blessings the Spirit will be able to produce in our lives. We've already kind of touched on that this morning. That the internal should affect the external. That, you know, like if we gain a gentle spirit within us, we should start acting gently to the people on the outside, right? And actually something I didn't even put on here, but that we, that's been another one that's come up a lot is, hey, this isn't just for you and me right? This is for the people on the outside. Fruit trees produce fruit, not just for themselves, but also to be a blessing of those who might come into contact with the fruit tree, right? Whenever we're producing fruit of the Spirit, hopefully this is an external thing that is blessing people around us and drawing them to want to know closer where we are finding the root to have so much produce in a despairing world. And then the last one is... Um, you know, our actions and our reactions, they show us what our lives are really rooted in. Are we producing fruit of the Spirit of God, or are we producing fruit of the world? Just simply evaluating our lives. When I walk into a room, do I make that room more peaceful, joyful, gentle, faithful, or do I make it more chaotic, bitter, angry, frustrated, whatever, right? What are we producing? What are our roots grounded in? Hopefully we find that it's God, and if not, then we have some adjusting to do. So this has kind of been our last almost two months now, and I hope that this has helped you grow. <clears throat> I, hope, I know it has for me. I love doing these kind of studies. But as we wrap up this morning, I just want to read the passage. Can't do anything better than that, right? Read the passage in Galatians 5, not just the fruit of the Spirit, but the, the whole passage is surrounding that. So Galatians chapter 5, if you'd like to turn there, you're welcome to. I see some of you doing that. Galatians chapter 5, just starting... In verse 13, we're going to go all the way to verse 25. <clears throat> Paul writes to this, frust he's, if you read Galatians, Paul's, Paul's a little frustrated here. <laughs> he's not, he's, they've, they've not exactly been that core example of a, of a positive church like some of the other ones he writes to. Now, he's, he's a bit frustrated. He's frustrated with the Corinthians too, but he's maybe a little bit more patient with them. So these Galatians have gotten under Paul's skin a little bit. But as he's kind of concluding his letter, as he's kind of wrapping up, he writes... 
You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are they're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, fat, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. If we can help you in any way this morning, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?